This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to inquire how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter Barchester Towers by Anthony Trollope Chapter 3 Dr. and Mrs. Proudie This narrative is supposed to commence immediately after the installation of Dr. Proudie. I will not describe the ceremony, as I do not precisely understand its nature. I am ignorant whether a bishop be chaired like a member of Parliament, or carried in a gilt coach like a Lord Mayor, or sworn in like a Justice of Peace, or introduced like a peer to the Upper House, or led between two brethren like a Knight of the Garter. But I do know that everything was properly done, and that nothing fit or becoming to a young bishop was omitted on the occasion. Dr. Proudie was not the man to allow anything to be omitted that might be becoming to his new dignity. He understood well the value of forms, and knew that the due observations of rank could not be maintained unless the exterior trappings belonging to it were held in proper esteem. He was a man born to move in high circles, at least so he thought himself, and circumstances had certainly sustained him in this view. He was the nephew of an Irish baron by his mother's side, and his wife was the niece of a Scottish earl. He had for years held some clerical office appertaining to courtly matters, which had enabled him to live in London, and to entrust his parish to his curate. He had been a preacher to the royal beef-eaters, curator of theological manuscripts in the ecclesiastical courts, chaplain of the Queen's Yeomanry Guard, an almoner to His Royal Highness, the Prince of Rappe Blankenberg. His residence in the metropolis rendered necessary by the duties entrusted to him, his high connections, and the peculiar talents and nature of the man, recommended him to persons in power, and Dr. Proudie became known as a useful and rising clergyman. Some few years since, even within the memory of many who are not yet willing to call themselves old, a liberal clergyman was a person not frequently to be met. Sidney Smith was such and was looked on as little better than an infidel. A few others also might be named, but they were rare aves, and were regarded with doubt and distrust by their brethren. No man was so surely a Tory as a country rector. Nowhere were the powers that be so cherished as at Oxford. When, however, Dr. Waitley was made an archbishop, and Dr. Hamden some years afterwards regius professor, Many wise divines saw that a change was taking place in men's minds, and that more liberal ideas would henceforth be suitable to the priests as well as to the laity. Clergymen began to be heard of who had ceased to anathematise papists on the one hand, or vilify dissenters on the other. It appeared clear that high church principles, as they are called, were no longer to be the surest claims to promotion, with at any rate one section of statesmen, and Dr. Proudie was one among those who early in life adapted himself to the views held by the Whigs on most theological and religious subjects. He bore with the idolatry of Rome, tolerated even the infidelity of Socianism, and was hand in glove with the Presbyterian synods of Scotland and Ulster. Such a man at such a time was found to be useful, and Dr. Proudie's name began to appear in the newspapers, he was made one of a commission who went over to Ireland to arrange matters preparative to the working of the National Board. He became honorary secretary to another commission, nominated to inquire into the revenues of cathedral chapters, and had had something to do with both the Regium Donum and the Maynooth Grant. It must not on this account be taken as proved that Dr. Proudie was a man of great mental powers, or even of much capacity for business for such qualities had not been required in him. In the arrangement of those church reforms with which he was connected, the ideas and original conception of the work to be done were generally furnished by the liberal statesmen of the day, and the labour of the details was borne by officials of a lower rank. It was, however, thought expedient that the name of some clergyman should appear in such matters, and as Dr. Proudie had become known as a tolerating divine, great use of this sort was made of his name. If he did not do much active good, 
he never did any harm. He was amenable to those who were really in authority, and at the sittings of the various boards to which he belonged, maintained a kind of dignity which had its value. He was certainly possessed of sufficient tact to answer the purpose for which he was required, without making himself troublesome, but it must not therefore be surmised that he doubted his own power, or failed to believe that he could himself take a high part in high affairs when his own turn came. He was biding his time, and patiently looking forward to the days when he himself would sit authoritative at some board, and talk and direct, and rule the roost, while lesser stars sat round and obeyed, as he had so well accustomed himself to do. His reward and his time had now come. He was selected for the vacant bishopric, and on the next vacancy which might occur in any diocese would take his place in the House of Lords, prepared to give not a silent vote in all matters concerning the wheel of the church establishment. Toleration was to be the basis on which he was to fight his battles, and in the honest courage of his heart he thought no evil would come to him in encountering even such foes as his brethren of Exeter and Oxford. Dr. Proudie was an ambitious man, and before he was well consecrated Bishop of Barchester, he had begun to look up to archiepiscopal splendour, and the glories of Lambeth, or at any rate of Bishopsthorpe. He was comparatively young, and had, as he fondly flattered himself, been selected as possessing such gifts, natural and acquired, as must be sure to recommend him to a yet higher notice, now that a higher sphere was opened to him. Dr. Proudie was, therefore, quite prepared to take a conspicuous part in all theological affairs appertaining to these realms, and having such views by no means intended to bury himself at Barchester as his predecessor had done. No, London should still be his ground. A comfortable mansion in a provincial city might be well enough for the dead months of the year. Indeed, Dr. Proudie had always felt it necessary to his position to retire from London when other great and fashionable people did so. But London should still be his fixed residence, and it was in London that he resolved to exercise that hospitality so peculiarly recommended to all bishops by St. Paul. How otherwise could he keep himself before the world? How else give the government, in matters theological, the full benefit of his weight and talents? This resolution was no doubt a salutary one as regarded the world at large, but was not likely to make him popular either with the clergy or the people of Barchester. Dr. Grantly had always lived there, in truth, it was hard for a bishop to be popular after Dr. Grantly. His income had averaged £9,000 a year. His successor was to be rigidly limited to £5,000. He had but one child on whom to spend his money. Dr. Proudie had seven or eight. He had been a man of few personal expenses, and they had been confined to the tastes of a moderate gentleman. But Dr. Proudie had to maintain a position in fashionable society— and had that to do with comparatively small means. Dr. Grantly had certainly kept his carriages as became a bishop, but his carriage, horses, and coachmen, though they did very well for Barchester, would have been almost ridiculous at Westminster. Mrs. Proudie determined that her husband's equipage should not shame her, and things on which Mrs. Proudie resolved were generally accomplished. From all this, it was likely to result that Dr. Proudie would not spend much money at Barchester, whereas his predecessor had dealt with the tradesmen in the city in a manner very much to their satisfaction. The Grantleys, father and son, had spent their money like gentlemen, but it soon became whispered in Barchester that Dr. Proudie was not unacquainted with those prudent devices by which the utmost show of wealth is produced from limited means. In person— Dr. Proudie is a good-looking man, spruce and dapper, and very tidy. He is somewhat below middle height, being about five feet four, but he makes up for the inches which he wants, by the dignity with which he carries those which he has. It is no fault of his own if he has not a commanding eye, for he studies hard to assume it. His features are well formed, though perhaps the sharpness of his nose may give to his face in the eyes of some people— an air of insignificance. If so, it is greatly redeemed by his mouth and chin, of which he is justly proud. 
Dr. Proudie may well be said to have been a fortunate man, for he was not born to wealth, and he is now Bishop of Barchester. But nevertheless he has his cares. He has a large family, of whom the three eldest are daughters, now all grown up and fit for fashionable life. And he has a wife. It is not my intention to breathe a word against the character of Mrs. Proudie, but still I cannot think that with all her virtues she adds much to her husband's happiness. The truth is that in matters domestic she rules supreme over her titular lord, and rules with a rod of iron. Nor is this all. Things domestic Dr. Proudie might have abandoned to her, if not voluntarily, yet willingly. But Mrs. Proudie is not satisfied with such home dominion, and stretches her power over all his movements, and will not even abstain from things spiritual. In fact, the bishop is henpecked. The archdeacon's wife, in her happy home at Plumstead, knows how to assume the full privileges of her rank, and express her own mind in becoming tone and place. But Mrs. Grantly's sway, if sway she has, is easy and beneficent. She never shames her husband. Before the world she is a pattern of obedience. Her voice is never loud, nor her look sharp. Doubtless she values power, and has not unsuccessfully striven to acquire it. But she knows what should be the limits of woman's rule. Not so, Mrs. Proudie. This lady is habitually authoritative to all, but to her poor husband she is despotic. Successful as has been his career in the eyes of the world, it would seem that in the eyes of his wife he is never right. All hope of defending himself has long passed from him. Indeed, he rarely even attempts self-justification, and is aware that submission produces the nearest approach to peace which his own house can ever attain. Mrs. Proudie has not been able to sit at the boards and committees to which her husband has been called by the State, nor, as he often reflects, can she make her voice heard in the House of Lords. It may be that she will refuse to him permission to attend to this branch of a bishop's duties. It may be that she will insist on his close attendance to his own closet. He has never whispered a word on the subject to living ears, but he has already made his fixed resolve. Should such an attempt be made, he will rebel. Dogs have turned against their masters, and even Neapolitans against their rulers, when oppression has been too severe. And Dr. Proudie feels within himself that if the cord be drawn too tight, he also can muster courage and resist. The state of vassalage in which our bishop has been kept by his wife has not tended to exalt his character in the eyes of his daughters, who assume, in addressing their father, too much of that authority which is not properly belonging, at any rate, to them. They are, on the whole, fine, engaging young ladies. They are tall and robust like their mother, whose high cheekbones and, we may say, auburn hair they all inherit. They think somewhat too much of their grand-uncles, who have not hitherto returned the compliment by thinking much of them. But now that their father is a bishop, it is probable that family ties will be drawn closer. Considering their connection with the church, they entertain but few prejudices against the pleasures of the world, and have certainly not distressed their parents, as too many English girls have lately done, by any enthusiastic wish to devote themselves to the seclusion of a Protestant nunnery. Dr. Proudie's sons are still at school. One other marked peculiarity in the character of the bishop's wife must be mentioned. Though not averse to the society and manners of the world, she is in her own way a religious woman, and the form in which this tendency shows itself in her is by a strict observance of Sabbatarian rule. Dissipation and low dresses during the week are, under her control, atoned for by three services, an evening sermon read by herself, and a perfect abstinence from any cheering employment on the Sunday. Unfortunately for those under her roof to whom the dissipation and low dresses are not extended, her servants namely, and her husband, the compensating strictness of the Sabbath includes all. Woe betide the recreant housemaid, who is found to have been listening to the honey of a sweetheart in the Regent's Park, instead of the soul-stirring evening discourse of Mr. Slope. Not only is she sent adrift, but she is so sent with a character which leaves her little hope of a decent place. 
Woe betide the six-foot hero who escorts Mrs. Proudie to her pew in red plush breeches, if he slips away to the neighbouring beer-house instead of falling into the back seat appropriated for his use. Mrs. Proudie has the eyes of Argus for such offenders. Occasional drunkenness in the week may be overlooked, for six feet on low wages are hardly to be procured if the morals are always kept at a high pitch. But not even for grandeur or economy will Mrs. Proudie forgive a desecration of the Sabbath. In such matters Mrs. Proudie allows herself to be often guided by that eloquent preacher, the Reverend Mr. Slope, and as Dr. Proudie is guided by his wife, it necessarily follows that the eminent man we have named has obtained a good deal of control over Dr. Proudie in matters concerning religion. Mr. Slope's only preferment has hitherto been that of reader and preacher in a London district church, and on the consecration of his friend the new bishop, he readily gave this up to undertake the onerous but congenial duties of domestic chaplain to his lordship. Mr. Slope, however, on his first introduction, must not be brought before the public at the tail of a chapter. End of chapter 3